Hi, I'm Gordon Lamp here with the Real Finds Podcast, a podcast series where we interview key entrepreneurs, scientists, and activists who are shaping real estate and, as a result, our world. Today on the podcast, we have Jason Cochran. Jason is a co host of the Geeks, Geezers, and Globalization Show, which is a top 1% business podcast. He's also a business psychologist and consultant. On the podcast, we discuss the future of work, adaptability, technology, and tips and tricks for HR departments and business managers to get more out of their employees and their business. Hey, Jason, thank you very much for hopping on the podcast today. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to sharing some things and learning some things today with your audience, Gordon. Great. So um, before we start off, um, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Jason Cochran. Um, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm an organizational psychologist, so I enjoy coming in and creating healthier connections between people and the work ecosystem. And as I think we'll get to talk about today, there's a lot of changes that are going on with the future of work <laughs> in terms of how we work, um, how people view work in their lives. And so lots of exciting stuff to dig, to dig into today. So uh, before we start and start off by uh, digging into uh, a little bit more on work and uh, the brain. Um, I'm curious, are you a Hoosier originally or uh, are you a, a Hoosier from uh, from outside the state of Indiana? Yeah, great question. I'm from Indiana, um, a little town called Logan Sport, which is close to another town people may have heard of before from the Beach Boys called Kokomo. Yes, there really is a Kokomo, <laughs> Indiana. It's not as beautiful as the Kokomo in the Caribbean, um, but it's still close to my hometown. So yeah, I grew up in Indiana. Um, and then moved down to Nashville, Tennessee, lived in Tennessee for a while. But I've always been a Boilermaker fan. So huge Purdue fan, Boiler up to any uh, Purdue fans that are out there listening to the podcast, excited for the upcoming football and basketball seasons. Look, as a Midwesterner, I know plenty of Purdue fans. But the thing that makes me particularly curious about you is why psychology? Uh, there are a lot of fields that intelligent people get into. Um, what sparked uh, your interest in psychology? Yeah, this is a, a pretty easy one for me to answer here. Um, I noticed a lot of people in my family, they hated the work that they did. Anytime, and I don't know if this is your experience or any of the listeners too, growing up as a kid when we'd have family get-togethers and anybody was talking about work, it always had a negative connotation. Uh, the stuff that I'd hear like from my parents or my aunts and uncles, cousins, uh, siblings, my older siblings would be things like, I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate the culture. I don't get paid enough. Like literally there were very few times I ever heard something positive coming out of their mouths about work. And what I realized later on in life was this was going to be my passion was coming out of the, the, the pain that they were sharing with me that I was distilling in my, um, my young brain at that time, which was work was completely out of whack with contributing anything other than a paycheck for my family members and and that just broke my heart because i got to thinking it doesn't have to be this way work can and should be something that's a healthy part of who we want to be and make healthy contributions to our life and so that's the journey i'm on that's why i became really passionate about psychology and my why is all about creating healthier connections between people and the work so you talked a lot about why folks uh struggle with work and some folks really hate their jobs. There's a lot of craziness that's going on in the work world right now. And uh, it doesn't have to be just work from home culture. There's a tremendous amount of alienation going on, a tremendous amount of distress, people unhappy with their jobs, the way we work. I'm curious, what are you seeing from your perspective as like, as an educational and, and workplace psychologist? Sure. Let's start with the bad news, then I'm going to share the good news. Uh, just as you talked about, Gordon, if you look at basically any type of report that's out from the top consulting firms in the world on work, whether it be McKinsey, um, Deloitte, Corn Ferry, Gallup, all of them are pretty much saying the same things, but just in different nomenclature. And that is we have major disconnect between people and work. Anything from uh, people feeling like they don't have autonomy and flexibility in where they work, when they work, what type of work they're doing, who they're working with on their team. Those are things that are majorly stressful. Obviously, we have rampant inflation. 
um, currently in the United States, but also globally, that's become more of a concern. So people in terms of how much pay they're getting, those dollars aren't going as far as they used to. So all of that to say, the bad news is, yes, we're kind of in a point right now where a lot of people are feeling stressed or unhappy or dissatisfied, not engaged, whatever you want to call it, with work. Here's the good news. Everything that I'm learning, not just in my own work, but from the, the top global thought leaders that come on my podcast called Geek Skeezers Googleization, which is on the future of work, everything these futurists are sharing with me is things are going to get better. Now, we are going to go through a, a very rapid phase here of disruption as we're figuring things out with automation, with um, artificial intelligence, and soon to be in the next couple of years, artificial generative um, or general intelligence, rather. But once we get into that phase, imagine this, Gordon. What if you could get paid just like you do? Like, let's take a typical schedule, 40 hours a week, you get paid a salary, right? What if in the future of work, in the next five years, you could get paid that same amount, but you're only working 20 hours? We've yeah, been I mean, that programmed. Would be... That'd be incredible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've we've been programmed so much because of the industrialized revolution. This is what we've grown up in. This is how we've operated for the last 200 years, that you work your eight to four or your nine to five, that we think that's the only way work can be. And it's not. We're moving into the digital revolution when it comes to work. And what that means is you are most likely going to be working alongside an artificial intelligence agent, a bot, um, something that's going to come along and help you turn on some superpowers of becoming way more productive and efficient in your work. And it's going to save hours and it's going to save time. Now, the trick is we need our leaders to make sure they're not saying, okay, then that means I can squeeze you for another 20 hours to do something else. It's like, no, we're moving into a place where if we're going to, if we want people to feel happy and productive in the work, and those things are things that are essential. If you, if you want people to be productive, they need to be happy and engaged, and they have to have a high level of well-being in order to deliver value for the company then that means you don't go back and start filling their buckets up again. So we're moving into a place in the future of work where we're going to reconsider some of these old constructs and these old habits that we've gotten used to over the last 200 years that have served us well for the way work used to be. But in the future, now that we're going to have technology that's going to be able to come alongside us and support us in the work that we do, it's going to open up new capacity to rethink what we think of in terms of the number of hours worked, the types of tasks that we as humans are actually doing. And so I share all that to say, even though right now we're in this period of disruption and there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of uh, VUCA out there as well, we're moving into a better time period, but it is going to be a little bit bumpy of a road as we get there, as we figure things out. But everything I'm hearing from the thought leaders I speak to is very much optimism around how things are going to be in the future, especially improved mental health and mental well-being in terms of how people feel about the work aspect of their life. A lot of uh, kind of futurist individuals we've spoken to on the podcast and also just generally in, in the workplace, um, I, I have to say, have often compared what's going on to very similar to the printing press and how it drastically reshaped um, how Europeans and uh, Westerners and then eventually the globe uh, not only uh, took in, but disseminated information. Um, how do we get that good result uh, that you discussed? Because I think a lot of people see the future and the future of AI as kind of a, a game of great winners and uh, a tremendous amount of losers, uh, people who um, might, you know, follow in the typical 80-20 rule. There might be 20% that gets all the gains and 80% that loses their jobs. Um, how do we see it um, as a, uh, as a uh, plentiful, uh, great, uh, uh, beneficial thing for all of humanity and not a uh, scarcity mindset? Uh, because uh, 
I think that's what most workers I talk to and even some employers are worried about. Sure, absolutely. And that was even Stephen Hawking's biggest concern with artificial intelligence. His last post before he passed away on Reddit, someone asked him, what is your biggest fear with artificial intelligence? Well, previously, he had, he had had things before in press releases, media interviews that he did. And it was more the apocalyptic, well, if it's super intelligence and it overtakes us as a species. But that was not his answer to his final Reddit post. His final answer in terms of the greatest fear was the inequity that it could drive between the haves and the have-nots in society. And so that very much is a, a real concern. I think there's going to have to be a multifaceted or pronged approach to prevent that. Number one, we are going to need our government institutions to step in, and we need to have some ethical policies, practices, procedures, legislation in place to make sure that as much as possible, this is a fair level playing field and that things aren't getting monopolized because that's just going to throw everything out of whack in terms of our economy, in terms of the health and well-being of people. Um, within countries around the world. So that's going to be one critical component. Another one is we've got to shift mindsets. I love that you use scarcity mindset there because the opposite of scarcity mindset, as we know, as we know is abundance mindset. And that is seeing change as an opportunity for the creation of new value and new growth. You shared the example of a printing press and how that changed things tremendously. So just to go through a quick thought experiment here in terms of how we process change and how our mindsets need to shift, think about this. For every single human being that's ever existed, the things that are created within our birth up to the age of 15 for us, we consider normal. So an example, if I were to, to ask you, is electricity normal? Gordon, what would you say? I would say electricity seems pretty normal. Exactly. Or even, you know, I'd say, is the internet normal? You know, as long as you're over, the, you know, the age of 15, you'd be like, abs or under, you know, under a certain age, like we're in our 40s, we'd be like, of course it's normal. It's been around ever since we've been on this earth. But obviously, electricity has only been around for a little over 100 years, right? And so it's a matter of perspective. Yeah. So, I, so I take this back to when, Anything that's invented from your age of zero to 15, that's considered normal in your life. You're like, yeah, I grew up with this. It's normal. I can't imagine not having this stuff. Then the stuff that's invented from when you're about 15 to 35, that's the stuff that you learn. And you're like, I'm going to use this to my benefit for my career, my job. So that's the stuff where over you know, the last 20 to 30 years, it's like, hey, I'm going to learn stuff to become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant. Things like that, right? Things that we ended up, most of us many times, ended up going to college for. Here's the funny part. Research tells us anything typically that's invented after the age of 35, we tend to think, that's weird. That stuff is totally weird. I don't understand it. It doesn't really fit within what I'm doing. I share that thought experiment just to say the other component to this, aside from just being like, okay, the government's got to get stuff in order to make sure we've got a level playing field with businesses and people when it comes to AI and doing it in an ethical and responsible way. Yes, that's one part of the prong. The other part of the prong is we need to, re to totally reconsider how are we developing, nurturing, and training leaders and organizations in this mindset of approaching change as an opportunity for growth and that it can help everyone. That abundance mindset is critically important. We cannot go back to just the old traditional ways of capitalism in the way that things were done during the Industrial Revolution. We've evolved out of those times. We need conscious capitalism. Gen Zs um, in particular, but also millennials, they care more now about the way business is conducted around employee experience, around culture, and that's why we're seeing this rise in ESG and governance around those, because those things truly matter to the top talent in the world. It's not just about how much money are we making profitability for the board, for the shareholders. But it's like, no, we have a, a responsibility to stakeholders, to our clients, to our employees, to their families in terms of how we run and conduct this business. So I know that's a long-winded answer um, to what you asked, but I think it's critical that we not only get 
some legislation in place to help guide this as we're going through it. But we've also got to reconsider leadership in our organizations and how they view this opportunity so that we can mitigate greed as much as possible and approach this with more of an abundance mindset, just like I shared earlier, that, hey, if this means we can ask for 20 fewer hours from our people, but we're being more productive, that's awesome. That's good for them because it gives them more time off to do the things that may fill their bucket, which makes them happier and more productive in the work they do. Those are the kinds of things leading into the future of work that are going to help us be more successful and sustainable and working in concert with artificial intelligence. So one of the questions I have, and I'd love to follow up on some of what you just said there, is I, I think it's absolutely critical how we treat our employees. And I, I think some of the most successful businesses you look at, you know, be it in the in the you know fast food space from like a Chick-fil-A to you look at how um, you know some of the businesses that operate in the commercial real estate space or businesses that operate in um, even some of the you know consulting, marketing, go down the list, all have a very high regard for how they treat their employees and their talent. Um, and one of the struggles I have going forward with AI and, and how employees might be treated is um, particularly around that idea of uh, productivity. And we live in a global economy, right? No longer do you live in your little village. Um, and as a result, you're competing against uh, a global economy. And do you see businesses are going to take, you know, the Chick-fil-A model or where, you know, they give people off a day of the week or they, you know, uh, the model of you know, your Home Depot model where you do education uh, for your employees to try to bring in top talent? Or do you think it's going to be uh, uh, necessary um, instead of using market forces to treat your employees well, to have that government over uh, government um, regulation? Because you know, living in a in a in a global world, I don't know if glo if government regulation is necessarily the um, uh, the the best path forward. Because you know, your business, even if it's a commercial real estate business, is competing globally, right? Yeah, absolutely. And just to clarify, when I was talking earlier about government getting involved, that is around ethical development of AI, making sure that it's a level playing field in terms of how it's being used so that we don't end up having this dystopia that we were describing earlier, where all of a sudden you have monopolized a lot of companies that may be buying up certain AI bots and agencies and then just firing everybody or laying them off, right? Yeah. That's a yeah. worst case scenario. That's the stuff that we need to avoid. But at the heart of this issue of the fear going on with AI is many times we hear that there's a labor shortage, right? We're like, where is the good talent? We don't have a labor shortage. We have a skills shortage. Yeah. Huge difference. I, and this just isn't me talking. 100% agree. Yeah. But um, we, we actually had the vice president um, from Deloitte, their global leader on the future of works, his name is Steve Hatfield, on my show a few weeks ago. And we were discussing this, that at the heart of this, all of us are going to have to adapt and grow in terms of reskilling and upskilling. And it's going to require a lot of unlearning, learning, and relearning. And those are adaptability skills. This is part of the evolutionary process for us as a species. Because just to be, to be frank, a lot of the jobs that we may currently do or have done over the last hundred years or so, those aren't going to be the types of jobs or work that we do in the next 10, 15, 20 years. There's a startling statistic when it comes to education in terms of what are kids learning today in school, K through 12 schools, in terms of preparing them for the jobs of tomorrow. And what's interesting is the jobs of tomorrow, like by 2030, roughly half of them don't even exist yet. So how do you prepare them for things that don't necessarily exist? Well, one of the things is you got to teach them skills that are transferable regardless of the type of job. And we just described one of those, adaptability. Do you have the ability to unlearn, learn, and relearn certain types of skills? But we don't teach those habits. We don't teach those things on brain science in terms of how we evolve. 
how we move beyond certain habits that we grow that may not serve us any longer. Um, those are things that are going to be critical in the future of work in terms of being able to create and deliver value in organizations. Goldman and Sachs, they had a report that came out just a couple months ago on what they're seeing in their data around the future of work and skills and jobs. And it was pretty eye opening. They were saying, it's, you know, we have this tendency to think it's primarily going to be blue collar jobs that are going to be overtaken by artificial intelligence, but that's not necessarily the case. Some white collar jobs, folks that right now that are making six figure incomes in a knowledge based industry in five years, those types of jobs are either going to be enhanced by AI or they could be replaced by AI. And that knowledge worker is going to have to develop a new set of skills, right? Here's some examples. Pharmacists, accountants, financial analysts, engineers, software developers, right? There were five of the top 10 that were listed by Goldman and Sachs that are industries that are going to be disrupted by AI. Now, what this means is we've got a choice to make. If we're in those positions, we can dig our heels in and say, I'm just going to bide my time, um, ride the AI wave, and just pretend like I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and cross my fingers hoping that AI is not going to replace me. Or we can have another mindset that's fascinated by the AI and think, how can I bring AI into my job right now? Start learning how to leverage it, increase efficiency, productivity, use it for innovation so that I'm ahead of the curve and I'm creating new value for the company. I'm scratching my own curiosity with it and it's taking away some of my fears or maybe unfounded ideas I have around AI and it's future-proofing your career to where you won't be seen as expendable to a board, right? So that's kind of a long-winded answer to say, we everything starts with, with our mindset in terms of how we approach this and then the steps that we take in terms of engaging with it. But make no mistake, the folks that have that mindset of, this is just weird, this is just a fad, it's gonna pass, not and now yeah. is the time that you need to start understanding it trying to leverage it in different ways learn about it so that you are ahead of the curve and that you're already in the process of evolving of adapting of learning these new skill sets that are going to provide value yes for the organization but it also may give you back more time that you then have to invest in other activities and interests that you have. Look, the future doesn't wait on any of our timelines. So um, that's certainly something that, uh, that I think we can all agree with. Um, anyone who's been an entrepreneur or a business owner knows um, you know, uh, progress and change keeps mar marching on. Um, and I'd like to march on to a new topic that we've talked, to, talked about uh, a little bit briefly. And it's, the idea of the four principles of connection. I know that uh, you were uh, you're a big proponent of that, and um, I'm curious about. You know, we're struggling in this business world to connect with folks around us and to kind of create an efficient business. Um, and I'm curious, um, can you share a little bit about those four principles and kind of how they factor into the business world? Yeah. So what I discovered was there's really four types of connections that are essential to connect people in the work ecosystem in the right ways. Um, we have to be connecting people with themselves, with others, with their ideal roles, and with the organization as a whole. And we'll get into each of those individually here in just a moment. But fundamentally, the problem that I discovered in the work that I was doing with organizations, I kept hearing over and over again from CEOs and, and HR leaders, feels like we're disconnected. Well, as I dug deeper, this goes deeper than just people working from home and not being in the same physical space. The things that were you know, coming out of this were people really don't know who they are and what they want. Um, they may be in the wrong seats on the bus in terms of the role based on their skills or talents, or maybe just because they're good at something, that doesn't mean necessarily that that's what they want to do every day. There's lots of things that I'm good at, but they don't necessarily give me energy. It reminds me in my days, back working in schools and with teachers. 
Um, in one school where I was at, there was a teacher who was really good at helping students that had behavior problems. Well, guess what happened, Gordon? Every year, the kids who had the biggest behavior problems got put in her classroom. She comes to me one day and she's like, why does the principal keep putting the kids who have the most challenging behavior in my classroom? It's like, because you're really good at your job. You're really good at it. And she goes, well, can't we upskill or reskill the rest of our staff to where they can help this? So I'm just not getting the kids with the challenging behavior all the time. It's exhausting. Same thing in work. Just because someone is really adept with a skill doesn't mean that that's what gives them energy. Over time, it could eventually burn them out if that's all that they're doing. So that's a connection to role piece. And then connection to organization. Do people feel connected to the leaders? Do they feel like it's a psychologically safe culture where you can speak up and it's worth it because leadership's actually going to listen to your data, to your opinions on how things can be improved? Do you feel like there's transparency and trust there, that they're in it for the right reasons? And then ultimately, do you feel like the organization is doing work that makes a difference in the world that matters to you? right, that you actually care about. Um, and so what I found was each of those four areas, others, self, others, role, and organization, there was a lack of design in the employee experience from how we recruit, how we hire, how we onboard, how we do performance uh, management, how we do learning and development, how we do offboarding, all of those different parts of the employee life cycle that HR often leads. I found that most times there wasn't a lot of intentionally designed stuff around, are we connecting in each of those stages of the employee life cycle? Are we hitting those four levels of connection? So when we get a new hire, do we have things in our onboarding process that are helping connect them with themselves, getting to know themselves on a deeper level, others, their role in the organization? Most times when we take a look underneath the hood, no, that's not what's in the onboarding process. Basically, it's just a really fast track to being able to get you plugged in, throw you to the wolves a lot of times and get started to where you start making money for the company. So this concept of the four principles of connection is coming in and helping solve the problem of for too long, we haven't really put thoughtful, careful design into our people practices, specifically around those four levels of connection. And when we do design those four levels of connection in there, the outcomes that we get typically our healthier well-being for our people, but also improved bottom line business numbers for the business. Because now you're mitigating burnout and you're carefully designing along the way the things that need to be in place that we know for people are very important things in terms of how they want to be connected to the work aspect of their life. Look, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that's going on in the workplace right now is the alienation that employees have, the, the, some of the issues that we have with really building culture in a post-pandemic world. And look, I don't care if you're Karl Marx talking about alien, alienation, if you're young, if you're any of these great folks. You know, Aristotle said, you know, man is by nature uh, uh, an animal of society, right? And so when we live in this world where we're trying to live together and operate and work in a communal fashion and really get that power of building strong communities and workplace culture, what are you seeing are some of the, the basic tips that people can go out and try to implement in their businesses? Because look, pizza parties and you know all that, you know, rah, rah, let's go out for drinks afterwards. You know, it can be great, but it's not ultimately what builds culture in workplaces. And so I'm curious, what are some basic tips that if there's an entrepreneur or a business owner or someone in HR that's listening to the podcast right now that they can start implementing to try to get a little bit more out of their workplace? Yeah, I'm going to boil this down and make it really simple because there, there's a lot that you can do that's effective, but I'm going to give you one. Notice a firm need. This is in terms of how you structure appreciation and recognition to other people, whether it's in writing or it's you verbalizing it to someone. And I'm going to give you an example of what it sounds like. Gordon, if it wasn't for you and your incredible skills to write, to ask the right questions at the right time and use that curiosity of yours, there is no way that we would have been able to accomplish landing that deal that we had, because we totally would have missed the right questions to ask. 
I love that about you. We need that in our company. And thank you for sharing that gift with us. I don't know what we do without you. Well, thank you, Jason. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> right? Well, then that sounds like an oversimplistic way of doing it. But I noticed you. I used your name. I affirmed you specifically with your skills. And then I said, we need you. If it wasn't for you, too often, whether it's verbal or written, when leaders or whoever it is is trying to show appreciation to someone, it sounds like this. Gordon, great job on that project. Keep it up. Which one is better? <laughs> right? It's like, so I'm not saying that that's the panacea to all the problems. But there needs to be a recalibration of our brains and specifically how we're communicating with each other. And it doesn't matter whether we're in person or remote. The way that we communicate with our written language and with verbal language matters so much in terms of mindset. And so if there's oh, one yeah. specific recommendation that I think is relatively simple is recalibrate the way that you are conveying appreciation and recognition to people around you and get to know the ways that they like it. Just like the, the famous book on the different love languages, people have different languages in terms of how they like recognition and appreciation. Uh, for me, acts of service isn't a big one, but what we just went through, verbal praise, that's a big one for me. I love verbal praise. But if someone just like put a Coke on my desk is like, hey, thinking of you, to me, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But that doesn't animate me as much as someone taking the time and giving me specific feedback, compliments, and praise on something that I did or that they noticed, right? So get to know your teams. Get to know the different things that fill their bucket when it comes to noticing, affirming, and needing each other. But the other thing I want to share too, Gordon, on this is... One of the things in the future of work that is coming very quickly next year, in fact, is the Apple Vision Pro. Okay, this is a product. It's a headset that's much more involved um, and more nuanced than the one that Facebook Meta came out with, right? This one includes spatial computation and mixed augmented reality. Basically, what that means for most people is you can be sitting in your room and you can be waving your hand around almost like Tony Stark in the Avenger movies. And as you're moving your hand, you're actually flipping through apps and doing different things, clicking on emails. So it's going to be more of a three-dimensional approach, even if you're working from home, in terms of how you're engaging with your work environment. Right now, you and I, we're in Riverside. This is 2D, right? Very similar to Google Meeting, to Zoom, a lot of these video conferencing software platforms that we currently use. Those were a step above 1D, which was phone calls, right, or texting. The next phase is 3D. It is going to be where we can be at home, but we may also be in a 3D projected environment with other people, whether it be holographics, avatars, things of that nature. And what early research is showing us is that in that 3D replicated environment, the same parts of the brain and neurotransmitters are being activated as when we're in person. And so that's not to say that out of the gate in 2024, you're going to hop in the metaverse and all of a sudden it's going to be just like in person with somebody. <laughs> but it's going to get there pretty quickly. And the interesting thing is our brains are going to perceive and interact with those things in very similar ways. In fact, just recently, the last few months, there were two people a research study that was being done. They're on different parts of the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Different parts of the country. And they're playing a video game together. And they wanted to say, see, could they get their brainwave patterns to link up and sync up, even though they're hundreds of thousands of miles apart from each other? And they did. And it goes to show, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying, hey, we need to completely do away with being together in person. That's not what I'm saying at all. There are absolutely benefits to that, right? In terms of good positive neurotransmitters, oxytocin, dopamine hits, serotonin, all that stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. But what I am saying is we are about to move from 2D to 3D in terms of our virtual communication and virtual interaction. And so far, the early signs are this is a positive progressive step in the direction from a neuroscience perspective, of being able to get our brains to activate and sync up with other people and get those positive neurotransmitter hits 
much more than what we've been getting with 2D via the Zoom calls, Google Meeting, and things like that. And so I think that's also a critical part of this is helping people not feel alienated. We're going to have better tools here in the next year or two that's going to help us ameliorate some of those challenges because it's going to feel more like we are in person working with those teams, even if we're from home. The last thing that I wanted to bring up before we get to our final four is I just wanted to touch back on that. And so what are you seeing from the whole work from home experience from the a team building um, and kind of the uh, more mind science based approach? Are you seeing a, uh, a lot of productivity coming out uh, from some of the businesses that you're talking to? Are you seeing, uh, you know, a time of change? Uh, what's your perspective on work from home, at least from your position? Deloitte, a couple of weeks ago, Steve from Deloitte, Steve Hatfield said, we've got to move beyond just looking at productivity. We're evolving as an economy, we're evolving as a people, and we're evolving in terms of what it means to create value in the work that we do. And so Deloitte's really moving this direction as saying, if we're just trying to, to measure how valuable our organizations and people are by looking at productivity measures, uh, throughput and output that we did in the Industrial Revolution, we're doing it wrong. That would be like still using body mass index as the only measure we look at for your overall health. We know that there are better measurements now because of science. It's helped advance things for us. And the same thing approaches here. Now, am I saying that productivity isn't important? No. But what I am saying is we need better measures and indicators of the leading indicators that improve productivity and performance, right? And this is what Deloitte is saying too. We've got to do a much better job of measuring those leading indicators of how happy are our people? How's their overall health and well-being? How's their mental health? Are we equipping them with the things that they need? How are they feeling about the collaboration and the environment? A lot of those things that have kind of been fuzzy, we're going to move into an era and a time where we're going to have better signals and better data that we can capture on those things that are going to give us better predictability indicators than in forecasts of what we can expect productivity to be. And so my perspective on the remote work, when I look at the data that's coming out from like global workplace analytics and groups like that that really specialize in looking at remote work, what they're saying is the folks that are working from home, they absolutely are doing a great job. And that's why they don't want to give it up. Cushman and Wakefield is another organization that's measuring this. Um, and what they have found in their research is that anytime a mandate is given when it comes to where and when to work, there's roughly around a 40% immediate drop in engagement level from that employee. So all this stuff that you hear about RTO, we're mandating a return to the office, immediate 40% drop in engagement from your staff. And think about it from this perspective, in terms of a psychologist, when you force people to do something, how well are they going to do it? They're going to do it begrudgingly, right? Oh, yeah. If I'm a leader of an organization, why would I want to put my ego at the very top and say, well, I'm going to tell you, you have to return to the office just because you have to, because I said so, and have a bunch of disgruntled staff. That's not a great way to run a business. And I know that's a gross over simplification sometimes, yeah. but we need to recalibrate how we're thinking that we communicate as leaders to our pe to people in your organization. And that this doesn't mean that you're going to um, cater to every single wish that they may have, right? But it also doesn't mean the other, which we've been under far too long, which is from my ivory tower, I'm telling you what to do, and this is the way it's going to be done. That doesn't work either. That leads to burnout. And the younger generations, the millennials and Gen Zs in particular, they don't respond well to that, and they'll leave. Um, and so this is why we've got to go through this recalibration process of thinking about remote work is here to stay. A lot of organizations are moving to hybrid because they're seeing it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's like, okay, you're coming in or you're meeting in a central location with other people a time or two a week, but you're also getting to work from home too. There's just too many benefits to it that the research is really clear on um, that's tough for people to give up. With one caveat, 
The one thing that is coming out as a concern with folks that are working remotely, they're working more. On average, 20% more. So a lot of those executives that are like, hey, I want you to return to office. And because you're going to be more productive, your people are actually working longer and harder, typically, the ones that are working from home. Um, because they've got back to back to back meetings. There's not that window time of driving anywhere in the car. There's not that clear cutoff sometimes of, oh, I'm only nine to five. It's like, nope, I'm nine to five. Then I'm going to take time off. But then, hey, you know, I'm going to get back to those emails in the evening before I go to bed to get a head start on the next day. And so the data is really clear. People want to work from home. They like that option. Most of them do. Many of them are being very successful with it now, especially now that we're starting to work out some of the initial hangups we had of how do we equip them for success. But the thing that we do need to be careful of with this is people who work from home, they are tending to work longer hours than those who are in the office. And so that's something that leaders need to, to be aware of and also try to set up some rules of engagement or some good time blocking techniques um, with their people so that there isn't this constant collision between work life and personal life, but that there can be some healthy boundaries during the day um, so that those people aren't getting burned out over time if they're working an extra eight to 10 hours per week working from home. So um, I know we could probably do another two or three hours on this topic. And uh, this is certainly the work from home um, topic from the psychological perspective, from the workplace implementation perspective, which we've had on a number of guests, um, a fascinating topic. But I don't want to keep you all day here. So uh, I think we're going to get to our final four. And, yeah, sounds uh, great. One of, the, uh, one of the topics that I always love to ask is just, and this is going to, I think, going to be a wrap up of what we've already discussed, but where, where do you see the future of real estate 10 years out? Um, it's certainly something we've discussed a lot on this podcast, but you know, if you could say one thing that's going to be the big change driver uh, and how we're going to react to it, what would that one thing be? Yeah, if I think about it from a commercial real estate perspective, I go back to Cushman and Wakefield's report that came out. Um, I think it's around 1.4 trillion of loans on commercial property, mature or due in 2024. And we're anticipating a lot of those, they're not going to get renewed, right? So it's like, okay, if we're going to have all this office space, I think San Francisco's at what, like 40 some percent office space is currently vacant. Um, yeah. What are we going to do with that space? Right. And then that has implication for local tax policy and stuff like that. Here's what Cushman and Wakefield's leaders shared with me. Brian Berthold, um, was sharing that he thinks a lot of those spaces are going to be repurposed as mixed-use space, potentially residential, and converted into, into residential spaces. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens with that in particular. But I think a safe prediction is I don't think we'll ever get back to pre-pandemic levels of office space utility. There's just not as much of a, a business requirement and need for that much overhead of a physical footprint anymore to do your business for most businesses, right? So I don't think we're ever going to get back to those levels. Do I think that there may be an uptick um, in some capacity in the next few years of more of that space being used? Yes, I do. But I think it's going to look different than the traditional office spaces. I think it'll be more of kind of like a welcoming environment, almost like a coffee shop type thing where if you want to rent a space to work with a team or work with a colleague, that you can do that, as opposed to it being, here's your little cubicle area where you work and you come Monday through Friday. Um, I think that's going to be the, the major change. The other thing that Cushman and Wakefield's doing too, that I think would be really great for your listeners, is they've come up with this experience per square foot model. And it's being used at Pfizer right now, actually, to examine how effective is our physical space in terms of the employee experience? In other words, is it helping people drive value for the organization and is it bringing value to them? And with their model and their algorithms around this, what they're able to say is if you're a company that has multiple physical locations around the country, they can give you an actual dollar value amount of what the return on that investment is for each building to let you know, okay, this one looks like we're getting a lot of return on the investment. 
um, with our people. This one doesn't look as much, so we'll probably move more to remote if that's what people are wanting in that area. So I think we're getting into more sophisticated models when it comes to physical space, not only in terms of how we design it, but what we're using it for. Um, and, and that's going to be really critical to make sure that we aren't wasting space or designing space um, in certain ways that aren't great for productivity. And one last thing around that, any organizations out there, if you have the open office space, convert it as quickly as you can. Every single bit of research on peak performance, um, on flow, on, on people's ability to perform at high levels, open offices completely, completely destroyed that. Every piece of research yeah. out there. And so it was one of those fads. So anyone who's out there that's listening, I don't know if you have the funds to do it, but if you have an open office, just know there's a significant tax you're paying on your people's performance and their ability to deliver value right out of the gate if there's an open office environment. So definitely consider changing that potentially if that's something you can do in the next few years. Look, I've been an anti-open office evangelist since probably the, the mid-2010s. Um, there you go. All the data from Harvard Business Review to uh, some of the psychological data that I'm sure you're pointing to has very much gone against um, that as a method. And um, uh, the only thing I would say other than that is you don't necessarily even have to fully build out if you just use large, large furniture that basically makes it not an open office anymore. That works too. But you just need to get away from that as a methodology. I, I wanted to double back on one thing um, you said. And, and one of the interesting things um, about hybrid work is there are certainly a num number of folks that are moving to more of a hybrid work model that's based around hoteling. And hoteling is not an open office model or a model that has you know absolute downsides, but it has a lot of economic benefits. And so a lot of people are moving towards that model. And what we found from a number of folks in our market in Chicagoland is folks like Zurich that implemented an open office model. And some of the other large employers have seen a tremendous uh, downside with employees leaving work because of it. They feel a sense of alienation, a sense that they don't have their own personal space. They lose that sense of belonging. And I'm curious, um, what are you seeing in terms of employers implementing kind of that flex policy and return to work? Um, do you think hoteling is the path forward? Do you think you know, that kind of coffee shop model is kind of a hotel model, or do you see it more as maybe a WeWork kind of, you know, small offices, uh, flex, more flex spaces and less of the hoteling model? That's a great question, Gordon. I'm going to give you an answer that I got my first day in graduate school in psychology. And it's a two word answer. <laughs> okay. It depends. <laughs> right look like i'm a jd so uh lawyers also like to use that there you phrase go. as well there you go yeah i'll never forget that first day in graduate school <laughs> um my professor was like the two most important words you're going to need to learn as a social scientist and a psychologist is it depends people are jagged profiles organizations are jagged jagged profiles right we can talk in terms of statistics and hey 60 percent of this 70 percent of that so talking the majority of the time but at the end of the day Every company is made up of individual people and every single individual person is unique. And when you get that unique mix together, it means unique things for different companies and organizations. And so even though, you know, there are some steadfast basic kind of rules of engagement or guardrails to typically operate from, my model in terms of when I consult is you're the expert on your company. I'm just coming in here to help you understand your problem and what the possible solutions are. And it's going to look different for me for you than it does this other real estate company that I may be working with. And that's a good thing. And that's why I'm kind of getting on my soapbox here. I don't like company to company comparisons. Number one, who cares? Who cares what so-and-so is doing down the street? You're competing against yourself. Right? You need to be looking at intra-personal growth in your organization. How did you do this year compared to last year? And then what are the predictive indicators you have that are going to indicate it's going to be better this year than last? You don't need to be doing benchmark comparisons to other organizations or, oh, we're within the 10th. Per that stuff, for the most part, is not helpful. It doesn't help you make 
the, the required strategic and tactical changes in your organization that you need to make for your people, for your clients, in your market, in your organization. So I share all that to say um, that that's a caveat I want to put out there too of, yeah, maybe hoteling works for some organizations. They found, hey, for our people, for what we're doing, it works. But by and large, for the most of them, they're going to be like, no, this isn't one that actually is helpful for how we're doing business. And that's okay. And so at the end of the day, I think it's really important that all leaders and all organizations adopt this entrepreneurial mindset of, let's find out. Okay, hey, this there is may a be... great time. This is a great time for testing. I mean, I, I yeah. couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, absolutely. And iterate. And many times I feel like, and this is me coming from a recovered perfectionist mentality as a kid growing up, you can get inside your own head and you don't even want to start because already in your head, you're thinking of all the ways you're going to fail. Right. And, and that's not the mentality that you want to have. And that's not the mentality you've got to have to survive. Richard Foster at Harvard, he's pretty good at predicting. He's a futurist. He's pretty good at predicting the future in terms of successful companies, especially the fortune 500. His latest data have that by 2028, so we're talking in the next five years, 40% of the current Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist. That's how quickly things are changing. And we've got to instill this entrepreneurial mindset of, yes, we know things we're good at, but we've constantly got to be out there innovating and, and understanding what the market demands and shifting needs are of our people. And then... Let's try something and then let's iterate on that. Don't be don't be too afraid to share. Don't be too scared to fail, um, because if you're just going to sit back on your heels and keep doing things the way that you've been doing, it's a high chance if you're a Fortune 500 company in particular, you could be in that 40 percent that he's talking about and taking this full circle yeah. according to what we've been talking about. I love some of the quotes you shared about change. One that I heard from a guest a few months ago on our show, when they are talking about change. They said. You know, change never fails. Whenever we implement change, um, you know, change initiatives inside organizations, many times if something doesn't go well, we say, well, the change failed. And this expert said, no, change never fails. Change is like house money. It's always winning. What didn't happen was you didn't get the outcome that you were hoping or wanted to get. All of that to say change right. is inevitable. It's how well are you adapting and learning and iterating through it to improve your product and service and the value delivery for all stakeholders. That means not just your leadership, not just the owners, not just the shareholders, but it means your clients. It means your employees. It means your local communities where you are. All of those things are drastically important. So change never fails. Just oftentimes we fail to get the outcomes and results that we want from it. Look, uh, you sound like a scientist, which uh, would make sense, right? Um, so, um, in terms of in terms of going through and t talking about change, um, one of the things that we always like to talk about in the final four is. You know, you know, the changes that we make in our lives and the way in which we go about our lives. Um, and uh, we love to get life advice from folks who, you know, have, have done it in their professions. Um, and uh, the question we always ask in that regards is, if look, if you could go back to a young Jason in high school and say, Jason, you know, uh, I'll give you one quick little tidbit of advice. What would that advice be? Don't play scared, kid. <laughs> and this goes back. I said I was hey. recovering perfectionist, right, Gordon? Um, I was totally yeah. content not competing in high school. I was like, hey, I could be valedictorian, but you know what? Is it worth the effort? Probably not. I'm cool just getting A's and B's. Drove my mom and dad absolutely crazy because they saw all this incredible potential and ability. And I was like, you know what? If I don't try, then I won't fail at becoming valedictorian. I'm cool at being number 10 or 15 in the class. That's all right. So if there's one bit of advice I could go back and give younger Jason, I would have adopted this mentality of, come on, kid, go get it. You are competitive. It's in you. It's a natural instinct. But you're letting fear 
outweigh the hope and the optimism. Um, and that's something that I've, I've learned along the way. And entrepreneurship is what brought that into my life. Um, it wasn't anything else. It wasn't some wise teaching. It was continuously failing and failing and failing in entrepreneurship until you finally start seeing, ah, uh, here we go. Now we got something. Now we got something. And it's just those kind of, of things that shape you, that shape your mindset and that help you start to understand, okay, a lot of the stuff that my parents are trying to teach me, okay, I get it now. Um, but that would be the, the one piece of advice is don't play scared. And I'd share that with leaders today too. There are a lot of you leaders that are listening right now that you've been very successful. Your organizations have been very successful. But let me tell you something. The future doesn't care what you've done in the past. Oh, yeah. You have to come to the table, evolve, adapt, develop more of this entrepreneurial mindset, bring it into your organization. Because that's the only way that you're going to be able to thrive through the massive amount of disruption um, that we're just on the cusp of starting to experience here over the next two to five years in particular. So don't play scared. Adopt that entrepreneurial mindset and start coaching it in your people as well. In fact, a lot of your people in your organization, they probably already got it. So tap into them and help equip them to feel like they can leverage those skills and help coach others and take some of those risks in your organization. So I know you talked a lot about mindset there and shaping your mindset. And one of the ways that I'm sure you can tell me even more about is how you can change your mindset and, and change your neural pathways by reading and getting knowledge from books. And so one of the questions we always like to ask is, is there a book that you would recommend that our listeners pick up Maybe a summer read, can be a beach read, could be a in-depth, you know, war and peace read. But um, is there a book that our listeners should be listening to or reading? A hundred percent. I'm going to grab it off the bookshelf here, and then I'll give a description and the name and title of it here in just a minute. So what I'd recommend folks read to prepare for the change, not only on a personal level, but also leaders in an organization to prepare your, your organization for the rapid change. It's a book by Jason Pfeiffer. Jason is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. We had him on our podcast back in the winter, and he had just recently released a book. It's called Build for Tomorrow by Jason Pfeiffer. And it's all about having an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast, and future-proofing your life and your business. And what I love about his approach is, obviously, with Entrepreneur Magazine, he's done a lot of fascinating interviews with people like The Rock, with Barbara Corcoran, folks that have been tremendously successful in spite of a lot of challenging circumstances. And he funnels that wisdom down into a model where he says, you eventually want to get to a point, and it's called phase four, and his model of how you react to change. And it's the final phase, phase four, and it's called wouldn't go back. And that's the point that we all need to get to in our organizations and us as people is we become so comfortable with evolving and adapting and changing and learning and growing over time and unlearning things that we look back and we say, I can't imagine doing things the same way that I did two, three, four, five years ago. And I don't want to go back to that because I built a better system, a better process, a better way of living, a better way of thinking about things today and moving forward. And so I highly recommend Build for Tomorrow by Jason Pfeiffer. So much practical wisdom and tips in there for how you can leverage change and make it work for you and your organization. Well, I have to pick that up. But before I go out and pick that book up, there's there's one um, last question of the final four that we always like to ask folks, and it's the whole reason for the podcast. The podcast is to reach out to voices that are bringing insight to the way we work, the way we live, the way we interact with real estate. And um, the question is just simply, who should we bring on the podcast next? You've had a tremendous amount of fascinating guests on your podcast, and I'm sure you can't uh, you know, list them all off, but is there one or two in particular that we should really bring on? 
Yeah, I'll give you one. His name's Joe Sirio. And he is an expert on overcoming fear. What makes him an expert in overcoming fear? Well, he used to be a high level intelligence agent in the United States. And he did a lot of work with, in Russia, the KGB. And so, as you can imagine, he was in a lot of high pressure, very <laughs> volatile situations that were very fearful. And he now has developed a, an entire leadership curriculum on how to help leaders overcome so many fears that they have, including this fear of change, this fear of the unknown, with all the disruption and uncertainty of things that are coming our way um, with AI. So I'd highly recommend um, Joe Sirio. And we'll be happy to get you a connection to him. He sounds like a voice we'd really like to have on the podcast. But before we lose your voice today, uh, just like uh, one quick last question. And uh, the question is pretty simple. Jason, if there's an entrepreneur or a business owner or someone in HR or just anyone in general who wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? LinkedIn. Um, Jason Cocker. All right. Um, on LinkedIn is the, the easiest way to get in touch with me. I'm not sure if there are any other Jason Cochran's, but I'll spell my last name in case you need it. It's C-O-C-H-R-A-N. Um, and in my title line, you'll see business psychologist will be the first thing listed there. Connect with me. I love LinkedIn. It's where I've built a lot of meaningful friendships, relationships, and done some networking. And I'm on it just about every single day. So that by far is the best way to get in touch with me. If you are curious about the work I've been doing um, around the four principles of connection, you can go to Jason, D as in dog, Cochran.com or principlesofconnection.com and learn more about that work there. Jason, thank you so much for hopping on today. And look, we have to have you on in a little bit and uh, give us a little bit more insight into the way we live and work. Yeah, I would love to, Gordon. Thanks for the invitation. It was a fun conversation. Wishing you and the listeners the best until next time. Thanks again to Jason. We enjoyed having him on the podcast. We appreciate his insights. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like, a five-star rating, or review. Your comments, interactions, and subscriptions truly matter and help us continue to provide quality guests. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Gordon Lamphere at The Real Finds Podcast. Thank you for listening.